Um, so are there a couple of pairs out there that would be willing to share a couple highlights from their conversation? Oh, come on. I've been up here for an hour. Somebody else can talk. All right. it in our, oh, sorry, thank you. Sound. <laughs> yeah, and please uh, tell us your name. And, My and name is Marie Fox, and I'm from Peninsula Family Service. And uh, we use theory of uh, change in our major programs, but we haven't used it organization-wide. And that's what I discovered from Abode, um, that they use it organization-wide, and that's been very helpful as well. A great example. So. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share what they learned in the in the the uh, share pairs? Did anyone have a good struggle story they want to share? Those are always the best ones to learn from. All right, I will I will share my own just in the spirit of getting this rolling. The first time I ever did a logic model was in 2004. The thing looked like a subway map. It was like this big. It was we literally laminated them as place maps and handed them out. It had about 16 different colors on it. It had arrows going in every direction. Um, about four years later, um, a writer contacted me. She was writing something called the Logic Model Guidebook. And she said, I would like to use your logic model as a case study. And I was so excited. I thought this was a great honor. And I, I gave my permission. And sure enough, it shows up as a chapter in this book of what not to do. <laughs> Okay, with that in mind, does anyone else have something they're struggling with? Yes. Hi, I'm Camilianis Montanilla from Somos Maker in San Jose. Um, we developed a theory of change and a logic model about two and a half years ago, and I think it was very clear and focused, and we've actually got a lot of funding support around it. The struggle I'm having now is it was based on measurements tied to the school um, mm -hmm. so and third grade reading proficiency, but everything has moved to Common Core and our school is actually not even going to do any measurement this year. So I wanted to know how maybe other organizations are dealing with that struggle and um, some of you are thinking around when shifts are made to measurements that are kind of out of your control. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a mic coming to you, and please, it, please, when you do ask a question or have a comment, please do introduce yourself so we can get to know you. Um, my name is Mary Simon. I'm the executive director of RAFT, and uh, I think uh, the struggle for us has been, um, and, and it has to do with the change that's happening in public schools. So our theory of change is that uh, through project-based learning and hands-on activities, kids learn better and are more engaged. And uh, we, there's lots of research that shows that that's a really excellent way to teach. Um, and w and uh, the, our customers, the schools, have, not, uh, have had a theory of change w where they're measuring knowledge uh, in, in no child, through the No Child Left Behind, where they're basically measuring um, you know, factual knowledge. And so w what's been challenging for us is then how do we measure our effectiveness when the people who are measuring then the kids' um, learning and their, and, their, um, and their engagement in learning um, are not measuring what we're measuring. Mm -hmm. um, now with the Common Core change, um, we, you know, we anticipate a few years from now that the project-based learning is really going to start taking hold in the public schools. But right now, even for the next two or three years, they don't know what they're doing and how they're going to measure it and how, how do we measure what kids know. Um, and so that's, so, so we're still sort of in this situation where what we want to measure, what we believe in through how we want to change how kids learn is not what the schools are measuring um, and still not measuring yet. Hopefully in the future it will, uh, it, you know, there. So to get the measurement of how, how our program impacts learning has been challenging. Um, we've done some some things on our own that we think are va really valid, and had some. Uh, we hired a Rockman et al. to do some uh, external research for us, and got some really great results, which we uh, which we quote a lot. <laughs> but um, but it is hard when the customer isn't measuring what we think is important for them to be measuring. Faye, do you want to take a crack at that?
Well, I don't, I don't have a set answer uh, to, to that. It's a, it is a key challenge. I mean, I think what's right about the approach and smart about what you both described is that you're drawing on secondary sources. And so where you can draw on secondary source and you don't have to, and it's, it's well collected and uh, easily accessible uh, and relevant to the outcomes that you are seeking, that's great. You always want to, that's golden if you can find that. Um, uh, so th th that's, I guess, the first point. Um, the second is that when, when, when you find that golden uh, ticket, uh, sometimes <laughs> there are changes that are out of your control. And so how do you, how do you contend with that? Um, I guess, you know, the, the pragmatically, you can um, negotiate with them so that when they do put a new system in place, <laughs> which you're probably doing already, uh, that it reflects uh, the kind of measures that both they um, and you are seeking, and that can be useful to both parties. So, so it may not help you in the short term, but two years from now, which is you know in, in, in the wink of an eye, really, uh, uh, it could be here. And so, to make sure that you uh, stay in touch with the planning around what they will be doing uh, in not too distant of a future, and in the meantime, um, to be measuring all of the inputs and outputs and activities to make sure that you actually are delivering. Uh, 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 what you what you are saying you're delivering, you know one of one of the big things that I uh, and what you hope to be delivering. One of the big um, areas that I'm always advocating for uh, is an area that I call um, listening to our ultimate intended beneficiaries, the ultimate constituents for our work, the people who are supposed to benefit from the products and services we either provide or fund. And one thing you might look at is are are, are there proxies. Uh, that uh, you can gather that are about uh, perceptions, so student perceptions of uh, what they're receiving and the experience that they're having that is distinct from uh, the outcomes that are learning outcomes that you were relying on the secondary source for. Because perceptual data can sometimes be leading indicators of change and you get to hear directly from the students um, about how they're experiencing their learning environment. And that can tell you whether you are on track or not on track. And so anytime that you can think about, well, if I can't know the, the longer term indicator, but I can know a leading indicator, how might I get to that leading indicator? So that's, I don't know if that's a full answer. So I think we should go ahead and move into questions. And we're hoping there will be a lot of questions. We're hoping we'll be absolutely inundated with questions. Um, so we're going to try to do this um, by segmenting the room a little bit. Um, we'll start with this part of the room. Uh, if you have a question, please rise. Stand up. Stand up. Oh, come on. Everyone stand up at once if you have a question. Yeah, Hi, one, she's going to get all the airtime. Hi, Manu Fawanwai with uh, Pacific Islander Community Partnership. And I, I, I don't know if it's a question. I think it's just more of an admission that I'm struggling overall um, with our organization, which is in its infancy stages, because we started out as a community effort and then morphed into gathering volunteers and then realizing that the program that we work in, specific, uh, we, we thrive to promote is more specifically um, our community uh, summer program, which is in its fourth year, and we have an all-volunteer staff. And it's been crazy because all of us literally have nine to five jobs outside of this summer program. Mm. And now we're like, can we get money here? Can we get money there? But just, just hearing about um, how we need to be more disciplined in programming and hoping that this program can be validated with solid funding mm. because the community support is there. And it's been wonderful because, I mean, Congresswoman Jackie Spear came out and said, you're doing something right. Juvenile Justice said, you're doing something right because we've been referring our kids to you and they're not going back into the system. So I guess my question is, is that we're hungry for help. And I know there's a lot of help in this room. And so I would just love to tap into those resources because we've got a lot of brain trust at the table mm -hmm. with our volunteers. And we, I have to say, I'm proud to say that we have 100% volunteer support and being in PTA in the public education for over 20 years, I've never seen this. So I'm, I'm asking that. I don't know if that's an ask I can get today, but I'm putting myself out there because I'm just amazed by the stories that I'm hearing at the table. And more specifically, Tess, with regards to what you can do or not do and be effective programming, that's interesting to me because you see a lot of summer programs, you don't see them offering it to the older age group. So that's been our struggle because we do offer our summer program to high school students, 
but the struggle has been to maintain them and keep them engaged in programs that interest them. The other thing I would like to put on, sorry, I don't want to take too much time, I know there's a lot of questions here, is that our program started out Pacific Islander inspired, and it, it drew 100% Pacific Islanders at first. Last year we saw an influx of 30% non-Islander population throughout the San Francisco Bay Area, and even people who have flown in from Utah and Southern California and Arizona who wanted to take part of this program. But we don't offer anything with regards to STEM, you know, and, and, and other um, more academic type programs outside of uh, creative writing, which brings me back to when I'm looking for funding, it's hard to find funding for people, for programs that are just fun, like cultural identity, I mean, real money. So that's my question too, is connecting to that source of funding. And because I'm new to the game, I'm sure there's a lot of professionals in the room that might be able to answer those questions easily, but thank you for the time. I just kind of wanted to put that out there. And some of the themes you raise about how you try to move to the next level on strategy and evaluation, when you're a mostly volunteer organization or an all-volunteer organization, I'm seeing some nodding heads. So what do, you, what do you advise in situations where people really don't have a big staff capacity to undertake this kind of work? I think, sort of yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I've never been part of an all-volunteer um, organization like you described, but uh, the, the first thought that comes to my mind is your volunteers are really like frontline staff doing the program work, and there still is leadership work that needs to be done. You know, leadership decisions about what is the focus, where is the funding going to come from, um, what's in versus out in, in our scope of work. You know, do we bring in, do we serve uh, young people who are not Pacific Islander or is our programmatic approach so deeply tied to that cultural tradition? And, and there are many great programs that are tied, you know, uh, Native American programs, for instance, feel very strongly that their approach is strongly tied to that um, population. So I think making those decisions is a leadership decision, and if you don't have a paid executive director, perhaps there is a board member who can play that role, or a team of board members who can help lead uh, there, because I think that's where it begins. I can add, add to that, because it, it may be that within your volunteer core, uh, there are people who are passionate about measurement. I'll tell you a short story from uh, when I was at the Gates Foundation. This was one of the most remarkable uh, measurement experiences I had had. I went on a trip to India to uh, do a site visit to um, some of the uh, uh, programs, the nonprofit programs on the ground that were doing HIV prevention with um, female sex workers. So we call prostitutes, they call female sex workers. And these were women who, you know, to look at them, you would not say that they were sex workers, but they uh, were just very poor, just scraping by. They could earn enough money uh, doing sex work to, um, to be able to send their kids to school. Uh, and they could earn money in a way that their husbands could. Most of them were married. And it was really a, an incredible uh, 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 trip and to see what was happening um, uh, in their lives. But when I went to one remote uh, nonprofit and talked with those women, they were the most passionate about measurement <laughs> uh, that I have ever, almost ever seen. And I've been doing this work, uh, you know, since, you know, a long time. Um, uh, and it was fascinating because I went into this, like, little room, uh, and they had up on the wall uh, this big monitoring chart. Um, and they had all the names of the people who they were doing outreach to. It was sort of an outreach program that they were trying to bring education to the men who bought sex from the women and to the women. And they had all these people, they knew all the community members, um, and they tracked them and they uh, had all the different topics that they wanted to talk about. So they tracked the education service that they provided to each individual. So they had a, a data visualization, like we talk about that now, data <coughs> visualizations with all our technology. They had a data visualization on the, on the chart that they used their bindies for. So they all carried around these little bindies with the with the, um, that they could put on their, on their foreheads. They had lots of them, they were very cheap. Um, and all of a sudden you could see, you know, by quarter, by person, the topics uh, that they were talking. And 
they, they actually showed me, you could see, well, we haven't reached this guy in a while, so we have to go find him to make sure that we're checking in with him weekly and talking about these things and that. And those things. That's not to say, your camp isn't about this, but it was such, uh, <laughs> thankfully, that, uh, but it was such uh, an incredible, uh, it, was, it was so inspiring to me to see that these women were not uh, tracking um, uh, their work because a funder asked them to. Because there was a whole fancy evaluation that the Gates Foundation was doing, you know, tracking the, the, the overall spread of the epidemic, um, what was happening and not in all the many districts in India. This was really data for them to monitor their own work and to use that data in real time and then they aggregated up for the clinic and they compared their clinic to other clinics and they really used it to improve their program and it was so impressive. It was one of the most impressive things and it cost very little, you know, hardly anything. It took their time and their ingenuity, really, uh, uh, to make it so. Um, so other questions. I'd like to go to this part of the room because I'm kind of twisted and you guys are getting the short end of the stick over here. So questions back in this, in this third, way in the back. Oh, yes, that's you. On the topic of matrices and figuring out how to, to do your outcomes, um, I would really like to find a good consultant, but how do you know when you found a good one and where do you look? <laughs> <laughs> how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, I asked my peers. <laughs> I was just chatting with Ann here, who's a fellow grantee from one of our foundations, is like, who do you use? What do you do? Right? So whenever I run into fellow executive directors, um, that's where I ask. Because I think one of, one of the filters for me is, do they really get our work you know, with clients? And then I, don't ha I can skip over that education and I can take it, you know, we can just go to the next level. And there's all sorts of consultants out there, but there are some great ones. I think, um, you know, it's part technical skill and content knowledge and part chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think don't undervalue the chemistry, is what I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when you get into measurement um, and you think, oh, I really need, you know, a, a wonky, you know, specialist. Um, and, but sometimes, you know, you're looking at them, your eyes start to glaze over, you know, because you can't really understand what they're saying. So it's really important that you understand, uh, and it does have to do with you. <laughs> it, uh, it's really important that there's good chemistry uh, so that there doesn't need to be a translator, uh, that, that the consultant really understands and makes the effort to understand, you know, what you're trying to do, what your organization is about, the strengths, the, the ambitions, and so forth, and can help serve and service uh, you, and that you understand what they're saying and vice versa, that you feel like there's a really good fit. So can I add something to what Faye was saying about the consultant really understands you? This work has to be about you, in my opinion. That is the more expensive way. <laughs> it's the more time-consuming way. So if you have a consultant that says, hey, I have this template, we'll go through the template and so on. I mean, in a sense, what I'll just say is you get what you pay for, because for you to really have the integrity around this work, I think it's got to be built around who you are, where you want to go as an organization, what is your capacity for change. And it's, it's like the diet, right? It's, you know, some people can lose 20 pounds in two months and some people will, will lose 10 pounds over two years. And, and so I think somebody guiding you to, through that has to respect that you are a unique entity and your capacity for change is different. I'll just add one more thing. I was a consultant for 18 years. So I have to, um, <laughs> I, just, I, I, well, I can't resist making one more comment, which is that part of it is the consultant, part of it is you as a client. Mm -hmm. So uh, half of the success of the engagement will be how good of a client are you. That's one of the things we talk about at the Hewlett Foundation all the time is uh, you don't just uh, you know, outsource your thinking. Uh, to a consultant. That, will, that is a recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be engaged with them. You have to be as good a client as they have to be a, a good consultant. One of my best uh, clients I ever had was Alexa. Because every time when I mean, she was at Schwab, I remember like I'd write her a, a, a note um, and in an instant she wrote back. She was the most engaged client. Uh, and uh, it, that is really important because you get the most out of your consultants. They're the most motivated um, uh, uh, to, to help you, and then and you're really driving it. 
rather than the other way around. Yeah, and there's just sort of two more quick things because this is I, I do a lot of grants to nonprofits that hire consultants. Um, so uh, we've done a lot of research on this at the Packard Foundation. It's all available on our wiki site, which is Packard-Foundation-OEWikiSpaces.com. You can come to me after, and I'll give you that. Um, but the two greatest predictors of the success of any capacity building project are organizational readiness and consultant fit. Um, and for those of you who are looking for really concrete tools to help you through the process of finding a good consultant, there's a new website called impactrising.org. It has things like sample RFPs, questions you can ask a consultant during an interview process, all those kinds of tools that you might need to actually guide you through the process of hiring, a consultant um, and client bill of rights, um, these kinds of things. And it was developed by a number of uh, consultants and foundations and nonprofits together. Um, so that's one that you might want to look at for some concrete resources. So other questions? Yeah, in the yellow. Hi. So my name's Anne, and I work with an organization called Upwardly Global, and we help immigrants who are unemployed or underemployed find jobs. And we're very clear about our measurements, and what we struggle with is not the linear change, but the transformational change. So, you know, we can start with, let's say, a number of 1.8 million immigrants in this situation, and we can figure out how to scale up our model and how to be more effective and more efficient and everything like that, but how what we struggle with most is how do you impact the system to make the issue go away, whether your issue is preventing poverty or you know, fully utilizing the talents of skilled immigrants. And so where we struggle there is we look at how does change happen, that kind of change is messy. Often people don't know how it's happened or you know, what they did right until after the event. And so is it the tipping point you know, that finally tip, tips things over? We used to think it was that we established the proof points and then the systems changed, but that didn't happen, right? Or is it that you have a grassroots movement or you get somebody who's really charismatic or all the ways that social <coughs> movements have got rid of apartheid or got civil rights, etc. So I'd be really interested to hear where there are transformational theories of change that have actually worked. Um, and, and also, you know, what percentage of foundations have really strong theories of change? You have the resources to do the measurements and how much is the needle moving in terms of the focus areas that you're working on? Because that could be really encouraging for us to hear if you are seeing that change. And the final piece is we struggle with direct services versus advocacy because we can get our funders to fund direct services, but sometimes the advocacy work needs to be done to change the hearts and minds, but it's more difficult to make that a priority if there aren't the resources behind it. So sorry, that was a very long question. <laughs> so systems change. Are you, you want me to answer that or do you want, do you want to take other questions? Or? You know what, let's answer that and then because we have a lot of questions, I'd like to get a group of them on the table and see whether we can't um, group some of them because we are starting to run out of time. Do we have other questions, just out of curiosity, around this theme of systems change? So Chris has got one. All right, Chris, why don't you ask yours, and we'll see if we can get that into the conversation. Yeah. The, the question I was going to ask, which was probably part of this, is you talked about using the, the bigger the work you're doing, the more important these leading indicators are, and measuring the leading indicators. The challenge, though, right, is, if, is that just because the work is so hard and it takes so long, and that normally, we never move beyond the leading indicators. That if we get some success at the leading indicators, we sort of take a deep breath and, you know, consider it a, a day. And we don't, it's just, it seems almost impossible to use the leading indicators as a springboard to larger systems change. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to, okay. to, to ask about how the leading indicators could actually be helpful to understanding larger transformative change rather than almost being an obstacle to mm -hmm. it, actually. Yeah. So when you are tra tra trying to tackle a big problem, eradicating poverty, integrating immigrants into larger, the larger fabric of American society, growing leadership for the nonprofit sector, something big and hard, something <coughs> fuzzy and hard to quantify, how do you model that? How do you measure that? I'll let you take that first. <laughs> <laughs> 
carefully, cautiously, <laughs> humbly. Uh, <laughs> really, because uh, uh, I think you know sometimes uh, certainty is not our friend um, in in some of these very complex questions, and 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 that's why there's more of a movement towards what some people are calling emergent strategy. So when you're in this very complex kind of uh, truly complex areas like advocacy and systems change, um, uh, how, how, do you, uh, how do you predict when a policy is going to be adopted and, uh, and so forth? So um, I, I think uh, I, I don't have a magic bullet answer. I think in general it's hard, transformational change is hard. Um, you know, the, where you, you see examples of transformational change more in the negative, big war in Syria, right? There's, there's transformation that can happen to really cause chaos in a society that's easier uh, to see than transformation in, in the positive. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that, it, that we talk about it, but in reality, um, it, it, it is very hard to, to achieve. Not that it's not worth t talking about and thinking about, and I can tell a story about that if I have time. Um, uh, uh, but I do think that leading indicators of change um, can be important in the sense of most um, of our systems change work at the Hewlett Foundation relies in some part on knowledge creation. We're trying to create new knowledge, new policy research, uh, new, uh, uh, new, new research about effective programs, education in Sub-Saharan Africa, or s something like that. Some new knowledge that we're hoping will be uh, uh, communicated effectively to policymakers, to decision uh, makers, to people who are in positions of authority to allocate resources. Uh, those decision makers will allocate those resources. Those better programs, those better approaches will get implemented on the ground. And th that implementation will then lead to better results as predicted in that research. <laughs> That's a long chain. Uh, and you know, it is valuable to see, well, what actually happens um, to those papers. So the papers get written. The research papers are produced. They're published in a peer-reviewed journal or some journal. And a leading <laughs> indicator is who's reading them. Do any policymakers actually ever cite this paper, this body of research, this think tank, uh, this leading researcher as influential in their views, in their thinking, in the policies that they're promoting, um, in the legislation that they're helping craft. If not, well then measuring all the stuff downstream is irrelevant. So the leading indicators can be helpful in terms of just saying, are we on track? You can't stop there, but if you haven't gotten there, uh, then, then you're not doing something right at the very beginning. So you don't want to waste resources measuring all that other stuff. And that's sometimes what happens when people say, I really want to measure impact. And then you say, well, let's be stepwise about this and smart. And again, sort of what's the limited data set? What do, how do we measure the most important thing to start with and grow from there? So I think for me, it's, you know, policy and practice are two really different things. And you need to be really clear if you're holding them both in your organization, is there really one that's more important than the other? Um, for New Door, we're about practice, and we're part of some greater movements around policy. We belong to a consortium on transition age youth in San Francisco. We're a member of Opportunity Nation. We pro provide them some data. We do some knowledge sharing, but it's so clear that we're supporting the movement, but we're not leading the movement, and we're not the leaders of changing policy. I've been on the board of another organization where it was the opposite. It was 80% about changing policy and state law and educating practitioners. And then it had a 10, 20% practice serving local clients as a way to inform policy inside the organization. I think just having that clarity will, will help you not uh, get deep, you know, lose your focus. So I'm seeing a lot of questions, a lot of hands going up, which is great. We have limited time. So what I'd like to do is if you have a question, please do stand up. We're going to take all the questions at once, or as many of them as my brain can handle. And we're going to try to synthesize them so that uh, we can get as many voices into the conversation as we can, and so that Faye and Tess can answer as many questions as we can get to. So please do stand up. 
Um, please introduce yourself, ask your question um, in as pithy a form as you can, Ooh. and then we'll try to get to them all. Hi, I'm Allison Brunner. I'm the CEO of the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, the largest provider of legal services in Silicon Valley. And my question dovetails on this, but more from um, kind of the operational standpoint, which is I, I really appreciate the discussion about leading indicators, but at what point can a nonprofit claim outcomes? Mm -hmm. In, on this continuum, you know, like I sort of see what you're saying about the steps, but mm -hmm. where do funders allow us to claim where we're not over claiming? Mm -hmm. And I think we, my organization, maybe because we're lawyers, we struggle with under claiming mm -hmm. um, and also because of the complexity of our services. So it, I would love to have your comments on that. Great. When can you take credit? Uh, my question actually is similar in some ways. I'm Katherine Hansen from ALEARN, and uh, we serve underserved youth, mostly low-income Latinos in Silicon Valley, putting them on the college path through math and college readiness programs. So we have a short-term problem and a long-term problem. Short-term problem, leading indicators are easy. You know, do you retain kids over a six-week summer program? Do they pass the course? Did their skill level build? Those are really easy to do. The longer term, but it goes all the way through, we serve sixth through ninth grade, so we have the tracking, if we wanna see them go to college, we have all of the interim tracking things, and one of the, as soon as we become, pare down the number of things we track, we get requests from donors to track more, or different, <laughs> or more of this, so I, I, we struggle, frankly, with keeping the number of indicators to a, a reasonable measure. Okay. Hi, my name is Melissa Johns. I'm executive director of Breakthrough Silicon Valley, and we're an academic and college readiness program to put underserved youth on the path to four-year universities and help train future educators. Um, I can dovetail on Catherine's um, question because I also want to know from the funders in the room, including on stage, um, you get those requests for other things to maybe track once you maybe pare down your indicators or you, I heard you say that it's really important to think about what tells you whether your work is working and what makes sense to you. But more recently, and I'd say in the last year, more so than I've had before, in grant proposals, um, I'm actually being given indicators mm. for the field that I'm in the educational access and college access field, and being told that these are the common indicators that the funders have, that you know, a funder, let's just say, has decided help them commonly measure the impact of their investments mm -hmm. in an area or in the nation or in the world. And so it's hard to know sometimes, well, do you keep fidelity to the indicators you've decided mm -hmm work for you or does that make sense if Catherine and I are applying to all the same folks and and there's common interest in funding organizations that seem to be working in the way they want us to work um, and creating the impact they'd like to see does it make sense that we're moving toward having more common indicators in a field and therefore when we go to find the data that we need it's more readily available because the funders have helped us get to a place with common core and everything else that, that the data is there so i'm wondering about that in common indicators in a field okay great thank you we've got one more in the back and we're going to move over here Hi, my name is Sierra Jenkins, and I just started with Innovate Public Schools last week. <laughs> so this has been great for me. Um, and so I was very interested to hear from you, and you're starting from scratch. We're, our organization was founded maybe a year and a half ago. Most mm. of our staff uh, joined in the last six months. We're having our first team retreat in March. Um, so we have an opportunity to do things right from the start, hopefully. Uh, and so where should we be focusing our time and energy, and how should we be involving everyone on the team in that work? Uh, one more here in the back. Hi, I'm Kat Burns. I'm the executive director of the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. So we're an environmental organization focused on bird and habitat conservation. And my question is, we're, so we're going through a process right now of identifying metrics of success. Uh, we don't have a theory of change. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we're working towards that now. Um, but when we think about our metrics of success, sometimes it's really obvious how to quantify something. If it's a financial metric or something that's really numeric. Um, but where I struggle is that a lot of, when I think about our organization and what 
gets me excited and, and you know, what I think is a met should be part of our success story is relationships. Mm -hmm. And you know, how we are building relationships <coughs> within our community, um, how our partners feel about the work that we're doing and whether or not they're using it. And I, I'm just interested in your perspective on how you quantify um, those difficult things that are not necessarily so quantifiable. Mm -hmm. Really good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, Hi, and I'm Celica Rodriguez, also with Somos Mayfair. Um, I have a question about measurements. Uh, and just how do you strike the balance between not being so ambitious mm -hmm. in, in your measurement goals while also setting measurement goals that are really pushing the organization and um, forcing us to be more strategic? So just how do you, how do you find that balance? I'm Rajiv Khanna, I'm the Learning and Evaluation Manager at International Development Exchange. We are a San Francisco-based international social justice grant maker. And we just released the second version of our theory of change. And uh, what I'm interested in learning is uh, how can we complete the evaluation loop to use the theory of change as a learning tool within our organization? So. Uh, quite often we get uh, wrapped up in the means of evaluation and the models and the matrices and so forth, but we don't often uh, finish, finish the loop, you know, and, and try to change our own internal systems and processes and so forth. So I'm interested in learning about a little bit more about that. Okay. How do you make it a real learning tool? Hmm. Uh, good morning. I'm Marie Bernard, uh, Director at Sunnyvale Community Services. We're a very basic safety net agency for about 45 years. We're also part of the Step Up Silicon Valley experiment to try to see how we can move 1,000 people out of poverty, help them move themselves out of poverty, and there's about 15, 16 agencies. And we're trying to collect data, and it's a real challenge because we have different capacities, different programs, but the early indicators are that in Silicon Valley, it's getting worse faster mm. for the poor and that as soon as we make some progress or the families make progress, they're slipping back because the cost of living is going so fast above what they can afford. So it's been an experiment and one of the issues is to have our funders and our agencies know that this pilot is, you know, there's 15, 16 different views of what we're doing, but we know that we can't each do it ourselves. So this is the Grand Silicon Valley experiment. How can we get some funders to help us perhaps shape it, mm -hmm. either individually in the agencies or together, and be a risk taker with us, but also kind of accelerate? Because none of us hired more staff in order to do this measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to do it. We believe that the families <coughs> need some assistance to move themselves out of poverty. Um, but. The, the, the marker keeps moving for them um, as the, the divide, the economic divide keeps getting exaggerated, especially here. So those are, are great questions. I'm gonna try to group them and apologize in advance to, to folks if I, if I oversimplify things. I see one set of questions around measurement and what's in and what's out and what's enough. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you decide that you have the right set of indicators, um, that you're not collecting the wrong things or too many things, and that you've got that balance between um, not being overly ambitious in what you're collecting, but collecting things that are going to challenge you as an organization? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, well, they're so, they're so, Great questions. So I'm, we're, I'm not going to do justice to them. So let me just apologize <laughs> for now. Uh, the, uh, I would say one of the little sayings we have in our in our shop at the Yale Foundation is purpose first. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about measurement, think about purpose. Why are you measuring? What are you going to do with the information when it comes back to you? Do you have plans to sit with it and look at it, reflect upon it, use it? Are you prepared to do something differently if you have some surprises, some disappointments, some areas of great pride and areas where you're doing less well? Can you imagine doing something differently? So somebody back there talked about they don't have a theory of change yet, but they have success metrics. And I would just suggest 
that's the wrong starting point. Uh, it's not going to be the most constructive starting point. That the better starting point is to, is to articulate your theory of change. How do you think change is going to happen? What are we doing to advance progress towards that change? What's the information I'd like to have uh, that will help me knowing, uh, in knowing whether we're achieving uh, uh, that change? So, so pur purpose first. Really think about um, how am I going to use the information? There were some really good questions about, is it really? God, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you to have this be about you, just as Tess suggested. And at the same time, you know, we know that evaluation and measurement systems are, are, are strongest when there is something to compare to. So that's why, you know, the controlled trials are everybody thinks of as the gold standard, because there's randomized uh, uh, efforts and, and there's controls. There's a point of comparison. You don't have to do that. I would encourage you not to, uh, for reasons we can talk about at the break, but because uh, that takes a lot of social science skill, and you guys are in the social service business for the most part. But I do think having some points of comparison can be helpful. So to the extent that, uh, uh, that an, an organization on this side, somebody asked about, um, you know, does the funder, should we be using common indicators? And I, I would say maybe. I mean, to the extent that uh, you are you are pursuing some similar uh, goals um, in not exactly cookie cutter ways because you're each serving somewhat different groups, which is right. Uh, but uh, that 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 you're that you're trying to achieve some similar uh, goals. If the funder has some sense that actually these indicators, based on research, we know. Uh, would be good proxies to know whether you're making this progress. And we'd like it if all the grantees in this portfolio could measure this in the same way. We'll bring you together to be a kind of a, le a learning cohort so that you can learn from one another. So a lot of it is how, you know, how does this, how, um, how is it done? If you can actually measure things in a common way and say, huh, you're, just like what you were saying you do with your um, individual uh, uh, folks working with young people, if some program is doing really well against mm -hmm. a certain set of indicators and another program uh, doing less well, or one program is doing really well with girls, another program is doing really well with boys, if you put them together to say, huh, we're measuring the same stuff, what are you doing, what are you doing, and how can we learn and benefit from one another? Mm -hmm. So common indicators, some points of comparison, you always want to have that in evaluation, whether it's a comparison to baseline or a comparison to some industry benchmark or a comparison to what the research says your indicator should be at this point or a comparison to a similar program. That's kind of golden because then it's an opportunity to challenge your own assumptions about we thought our kids would be here by now. They're not here by now. Why not? What are you doing? What are we doing? And how might we improve? Mm -hmm. So I think this idea of what's in, what's out, what's enough, right? Um, you said purpose. Well, the purpose of the data is to inform the work. There is the other purpose, which is to leverage the data to get funding. And I think that is a practical reality of, of the business that we're in. Um, so for us, I mean, it's, it, it felt like hard work in the beginning, but we did. I, I laugh at your story because that's what I'm prescribing we have to do, which is the massive spreadsheet. Um, so we have a, you know, whatever, Matthew, tell me, eight column worksheet on metrics, I think. And we have each of our um, components. So imagine the rows about target population characteristics. And then each of our components, what are we measuring? And then target outcomes, what are we measuring? And then, you know, in columns is like, well, what are the metrics that we look at with regards to this part of our theory of change or our program model? Who's using, who's inputting the data, which helps us figure out how reliable the data is and how frequently it's updated. What is its purpose? What is it used for? Um, and then, you know, what's the audience, right? So then we have another spreadsheet that summarizes reports, and this sounds like your head's probably spinning. Um, you know, what data do funders need? What data does the board need? What data do I need at the executive staff? What data the, do the, does the program director need? What data does a case manage, manager need to see day to day as they look at their caseload and they say, I need to make adjustments here versus make adjustments there? There are many users of the data, and it all resides in your evaluation system, which is an expression of your theory of change. 
So until you go through that work, unfortunately, the massive spreadsheet, which is it's not, it's not that massive, it's probably eight to 12 pages, um, but until you go through that work of saying for yourselves, what is this nice to know or need to know, and who's really looking at it, you can't begin to throw out data or add data. So do I add data for funders? Absolutely. But I do it when it makes sense and when I can tell a story of the context where I might say, so we don't have common measures in employment, but I might say, this is our data, but let me remind you of where our youth are coming from and here's the data on where they're coming from. Let me remind you of the benchmarks of what we're seeing out there, right? And so, you know, our graduation rates might be lower but that really looks good in this context. And of course, we're always working to improve that. So I think that's how you do the in, out, enough, and, and you constantly test yourselves. I mean, we, our corporate dashboard has been using the same format for maybe five years now, and yesterday I was still having a conversation between my development director and my COO about changing a piece of data in there, but the discipline that's developing in us is, okay, if we put this in the report, what do we take out, right? Is there anything we can take out? Because we don't wanna overwhelm this, this dashboard was you know, at the executive staff level and the board level. And so you don't wanna throw too many data indicators at that level and drown them, and then we also reflected on, but when we presented this to the board, even if some of those board members have been there for eight years or more, what were the questions? What are the questions we keep getting asked every year? So we're not really answering that question very well in the data, so how do we add new data or present the data differently? So I think we have time for just two more questions, and that'll be our quick serve as our quick wrap up and then we've got a, a final quick activity for you. Um, my first one is, uh, someone in the back raised a really good point, which is not everything is easily measurable. Mm -hmm. um, so where is the space in strategic development and in evaluation for um, relationship? Where is the space for lived experience? Where is the space for passion and heart? Which at the end of the day, is what's brought us all into this room. Shall I take that yeah. first? <laughs> so, I mean, our, our people work there because they're passionate about this, this program, right? I mean, if you're not passionate, you shouldn't do the work because it's too discouraging otherwise. Um, <laughs> and, and so you've got to love these young people and you've got to believe in their potential for transformation. And we have it as our core values that individualization is one of our secret sauce ingredients. You know, we believe that each of the young people we serve has a unique potential, a unique capacity for transformation that may occur at a different rate. Um, so how do we do that? Well, one of our program components is individualized case management, and we make decisions about what is the minimum dosage, not necessarily the maximum. We think it's two to three hours a week. And we also believe that our case ratio should be lower. So industry standard, what is it? Is it 15 to one? Is it, you know, and, and we make a choice. It's eight to one, which is really lavish and expensive. But we think that for the population we serve, we do that and would rather rationalize that to our funders than, than to you know, disagree with our own theory of change. Um, so we do measure that and we do hold the staff accountable for are they spending that time and we define that relationship time or case management time in the four things that are meaningful to, meaningful to us. So it's not I spent three hours and hanging out talking about coffee but it falls into several categories identifying job goals or helping with job search, identifying career goals supporting with basic services like finding stable housing or complying with parole requirements or whatever. You know, you make your own categories so you can see where is our staff spending their time and how does that connect, even if it's qualitative, how does it connect to the ultimate outcome? Because then you might, you might change the recipe based on you know, whether more youth are, are graduating if you increase the dosage on supporting them finding a next job. Yeah, I think the question about quantifying results is a good one, and, um, and particularly about relationships. 
They're all good questions. Uh, the, the, um, the two things I would say about that, because this could be a long, much longer conversation, we don't have a lot of time, but one is um, not everything should be quantified. So there's a whole rich disciplines uh, that are about qualitative uh, data collection and analysis. And uh, I think we should honor them, too. <laughs> and, and when there are things uh, that are important to an organization and indicators that are more qualitative in nature, uh, it can be useful to use qualitative methods. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been spending some time doing lately is trying to understand from business, how do they listen to their customers? And so sometimes they use customer surveys, but actually more often than not, they talk to people. Uh, they, they conduct focus groups. They follow people around in stores to see, understand their buying habits. It's all qualitative uh, to try to understand their customers. Uh, much more qualitative than quantitative. So, so I do think that qualitative uh, data collection and analysis uh, is really important and don't undersell it. Um, uh, so that's, that's thing one. About, about relationships, I just, you know, one of, the, one of the tools in the philanthropic world um, that we have is what we call a grantee perception report. That is, it's a survey that's, uh, that's conducted by uh, one of our infrastructure organizations called the Center for Effective Philanthropy. <laughs> and foundations can engage the Center for Effective Philanthropy in conducting uh, a GPR, Grantee Perception Report. And one of the, there's a set of questions in that, in that GPR, in that Grantee Perception Survey, that are about relationships. And they're quantified. So, so uh, they're, they're questions like, how comfortable are you approaching a funder if a problem arises in your grant? How responsive is the, is the uh, funder to you uh, when you call them or reach out to them? Um, there, there's a few other, other indicators that are part of that relationship that they, they, they uh, uh, sort of bring it together in a, in a kind of index. But it's a way on a seven point Likert scale that uh, you can actually see how am I doing as a funder in relation to my grantees and, I'm, and I have that score compared to a comparative set of other foundations because we always get high scores because everybody likes getting a grant. But in terms of at the, what's the variation at the high end of the scale, we actually can see real statistical significant uh, differences uh, uh, in responses on that relationship measure. And if that relationship is important to us because we want grantees to come forward if there's a problem because our success is tied to theirs, we have to understand the nature of that relationship. So there are ways to do it, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean you should always quantify it. So we are just about out of time. Faye and Tess, I want to give you the last word, but not really, because I have one more thing for you guys. <laughs> um, if there's one quick piece of advice you want to leave people with that you didn't get a chance to say, I know we've had you talking a lot, but I do want to give you a final opportunity. I think um, speaking as you know, a human services organization, human transformation is hard, hard work. And it takes courage. Um, so I would say have the courage to befriend data because it can help you only be helpful in, in tackling this problem. It's not the only thing that will help you. But you know, really when used appropriately, it can be your friend, it can focus that. I think the flip side of the courage is you may not like what you see right away. And so you do have to train yourselves, your staff, and your board to not be dismayed when the data is not initially telling you what you hoped it would tell you, but to have the courage to go through that, keep learning, keep refining, keep asking the questions so you can get to the other side of where you then say, you know, we have so much clarity and confidence and we're happy to like grow this work, share this work with other people around the country. You're so good, Tess. Uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, I would just add, uh, I couldn't have said anything better. I, I, would, I was going to say, and I will say, be curious. So just stay curious. Uh, don't get yourself too trapped in a loop of certainty uh, to be tied to your program or tied to your services or tied to your products. Uh, be, be an open learner. Uh, being curious about what you see on the paper in your in your in your organizations in your programs, um, 
you know, use the data to seek meaning, to seek insight, uh, and, uh, and, and not for just um, confirmation, uh, but, but really for ongoing exploration. Okay, so I lied, so I have two things. So the first thing <laughs> is um, you have a, a handout, you got a handout when you came in the room, and it's got a space on it for a little bit of reflection. So just take one minute and please write down Reflecting on the session today, just one step you're going to take when you go back to your office. An idea, an inspiration, a thing you're going to try, or even just a website or a blog or an article you're going to look up from the resource list. Just take a minute, write something down. <coughs> a person you met today you're going to try to have lunch with. And then the other thing we wanted to do before we let you go is we did not want to have to have you email a survey monkey or do a survey monkey back to us. We want to survey you right now using the polling technology. We will not be showing these on the screen. I, I don't have that level of confidence. Um, <laughs> um, but if you could please uh, enter via text. We have three quick questions for you. The first is, how valuable was this session for you personally? Remember, all answers are anonymous, and we promise we won't get offended. So the answers are very valuable, somewhat valuable, or you know what, this just was not a great use of my time. Are, are folks pretty done with that one? Yeah, okay. Move on to the next one. Thank you so much. After learning more about the building blocks that we presented today, how important do you think they are for creating impact? So are you still at the mumbo jumbo stage um, or did we do some convincing today? Are they very important? Are they somewhat important or are they not very important? for creating greater impact. Okay, and our final question Just an overall rating. What grade would you give us? Excellent, good, okay, or poor? And uh, once you are done voting, we really want to thank you for the time. We know it's a big commitment to take an entire morning. We really appreciate your coming out. And I really want to thank Faye and Tess for sharing your time and your stories. <coughs> you two were excellent. Really appreciate it.